Moving into a fully developed adult brain, we are going to be looking at each of the different regions. And we're gonna start with the largest region, the cerebral hemispheres or the cerebrum. This is what makes up 80% of the brain. So we're gonna be starting up here in this region. The, this is the cerebrum. And um, this is the region that is responsible for, for what we consider higher mental functions, like being able to think about things, make decisions, make interpretations about the world around us. This all takes place in the cerebrum. There are two different halves to the cerebrum. There's a right and left cerebral hemisphere. So two hemispheres make up the cerebrum. And they are connected by a bridge right here. This, uh, this section right here is called the corpus callosum that provides the connection between the right and left halves. Notice that it looks white. That's because it is made of white matter. So this is a bridge of axons that connect the two sides of the brain. The cerebrum as a whole, if we think about the white matter and the gray matter, gray matter tends to be on the outside surface. So gray matter on the outside, that means that that's where the cell bodies are at. And then more internally, inside of the cerebrum, that's where the white matter would be at. So lots of different axons go down into the brain, um, and then there are gonna be all sorts of inter interconnections that exist between them. So only about the outer two to four millimeters is gray matter. The rest is, is white matter. The cerebrum has some really characteristic convolutions on the surface. It looks like it's all folded, and those are called convolutions. Um, we have different names for the raised portions and the more sunken down portions. The raised spots are called gyri. Gyrus would be singular, gyri would be plural. That word is right here, gyri. And those are separated by grooves, and we call the grooves sulci. It's like they're sulking, they're kind of sunk down low. So sulci are the grooves, um, and then gyri are the raised portions. And this level of structure, the, the gyri and the sulci, these are things that can potentially be modified. If somebody is really um, practicing a particular skill, then what we see is certain regions of the brain, the gyri associated with those regions of the brain, they actually start to grow. So that's kind of an interesting thing. The, the brain is not necessarily a static thing. It's something that can be reorganized, remapped, things, uh, resources can be reallocated as needed depending on what tasks we choose to do and what, what things we choose to think about even. So the cerebrum, uh, moving forward with it, the cerebrum is divided into different lobes that have different major functions. We're gonna start up here in the front of the brain. This would be up in your forehead area. Um, this is called the frontal lobe of the brain. And what the frontal lobe does or allows us to do is a number of different things. For one, it allows us to have co conscious control of our skeletal muscles. So this is like when we decide to move our arms or our legs, um, this is the region of the brain where that decision is coming from. This also is where a lot of our personality seems to be mapped to. Each of us is very unique and that uniqueness comes from, um, from from, from what's going on in the frontal lobe. Moving back a little bit further to the parietal lobe, this would be in the back uh, upper section of your brain, the parietal lobe, this is where a lot of our interpretation of sensory information happens. So if you put your hand on something and you, and you can sense that there is a surface there, um, that sensory input is being routed to this region of the brain. This is also um, certain regions in the parietal lobe. This is where uh, speech comprehension happens. We'll be seeing more of that later. Um, the ability to form words and speak to other people and express thoughts and ideas and, and emotions. Um, a lot of this is tied to, to certain regions within the parietal lobe. Um, you'll notice between these two lobes, between the frontal lobe and the parietal lobe, there is a major, uh, a major sulcus right here, <laughs> a major depression. This is called the central sulcus. It's one of those grooves that we were mentioning. And it's one that provides a separation between these two lobes of the brain. We'll be focused in on what's going on um, nearby the central sulcus in just a moment. So you can hold that thought for right now. Let's go ahead and, and describe these other lobes that we have. So we've got the frontal lobe, parietal lobe. Moving on to the sides, we have the temporal lobes. Temporal lobes are on the sides of your head. And the temporal lobes of the brain, this is where our auditory sensations um, get get recognized. So, right, you hear something, what's nearby to your ears? Well, it's just, it's the temporal lobe of the brain. It's like a really quick path uh, for hearing. 
So that temporal lobe is really what allows us to experience auditory sensations. This is also the region where memories that involve auditory and visual information tend to be stored. So memory storage is an interesting thing. It, it doesn't happen in just one location. It's something that involves a number of different places. We'll come back to that a little bit later on too. Um, but for right now, auditory and visual information over here in the temporal lobe is where that gets stored. At the very back of the brain, back of the cerebrum, we have the occipital lobe. The occipital lobe is where a lot of our vision perception comes from. So the eyes, um, if we were able to see the rest of this person, the eyes would be up here. This is the front of the head. And when we see things, there is a nerve that goes from our eyes straight back, uh, straight back to the occipital lobe of the brain. And then a lot of the interpretation happens in that occipital lobe. This is also the region that allows us to coordinate um, really fine motions that are needed for focusing our eyes. So occipital lobe plays a role in that. There is one more lobe that is not shown, not visible on this image. So I'm going to show you a separate image for that. Um, so, so far we've got one, two, three, four lobes of the brain. There is a fifth lobe. We have five lobes in total. The last one is called the insula. And the insula is something that we would see if we were to sort of, make, uh, sort of pull, pull these lobes apart and look inside, look a little bit more deeply. Um, the insula is right here inside. And the insula lobe is something that has a major role in allowing us to integrate different sensations, but particularly pain, pain information um, processing that a lot of times involves um, the insula. Also memory, memories that are associated with, with pain um, get stored in that region. So let's come back to, I mentioned the central sulcus. A lot of our attention for the cerebrum is gonna be focused around what's going on in this region. And that central sulcus, notice there are two gyri next to it. There's one right here as part of the frontal lobe. This is called the precentral gyrus because it's in front of that, um, that central sulcus. Okay, so precentral is right in front of, and then we also have the postcentral gyrus, which is right behind the central sulcus. Starts to feel like a mouthful saying all these things. Um, <laughs> we'll get used to them. Okay, the central sulcus, so precentral gyrus right in front of it, postcentral gyrus right behind it. We're gonna go on to the next slide and talk about what's going on on these two gyri. And as far as color coding goes, um, yellow is going to stick with us, so that precentral gyrus in yellow is still going to be in yellow on the next slide. Right here is the precentral gyrus. And then in purple is the post-central gyrus. So as far as orientation of this brain goes, um, this is looking, this is kind of like a top-down view. We're looking at a brain from the top and the eyes would be up here on this end of the brain. Um, so this is the back of the head, this is the front of the head. So looking at that pre-central gyrus right here in yellow, this is the region of the brain that allows us to consciously control our muscles, our skeletal muscles. And the interesting thing with this is that each region on that precentral gyrus is mapped to a particular body part. Uh, so if we were to, this is something that has experimentally been done, um, stimulating different regions along this precentral gyrus, like providing an electrical stimulation, this will lead to movement of different body parts. And it's very consistent. And what we're looking at here is a map of the different body regions that are controlled um, at different locations. So if we come out to the side over here, kind of like near the ears, on the precentral gyrus, okay, the outermost section of the precentral gyrus, um, it controls the muscles involved in swallowing. And if we move upwards from that, we have other muscles associated with the head, um, facial expression. There's a lot of uh, a lot of space devoted to controlling muscular movements of the face, right? There are a lot of detailed nuances to facial expressions, and so there's a lot of, of um, neurons that are devoted just to that task. Going up further here, we've got uh, the hand, and then so quite a bit of space for the hand as well, right? Detailed movements for fingers. 
Um, coming up further, we've got the arms, the trunk of the body, and then as we wrap around to inside to the to the inner section here, the inner folds of the brain, this is where the lower limbs and ultimately the feet are. So it's almost like there's a person sort of laid out over the top of the brain in terms of regions that are controlled um, by different parts along the precentral gyrus. It's a really neat mapping that, that is at this point understood. Coming over to the postcentral gyrus in purple, this is the region that allows us to perceive sensory input. So in yellow, we like to call this the motor cortex, cortex being part of the brain, motor cortex, just meaning that it allows us to control our motor functions. In purple though, the somatosensory cortex, um, it's named such because this is exactly what it's doing. It's providing us sensory information from the body. So somatosensory cortex, the region of the brain that allows us to, have, to experience sensations um, from all throughout the body. There's a very similar sort of mapping for the somatosensory cortex. So if, for example, if something, uh, if a bug comes and lands on your hand, and if you experience that sensation, something's on my hand, um, the region of the brain that's going to be electrically stimulated as a result of that is right about here. Okay, so right, right around this region on the somatosensory cortex. That's where these neurons are going to be sending action potentials, um, getting lit up because they're receiving that signal. So very similar mapping, you can check it out here. Um, head and face still on the outside and the lower limbs uh, generally wrap around on the inside. And then finally, just in case you missed it, here are some of the different functions of these different lobes. I already described a lot of the major ones, uh, but the slide included just for the sake of, of being able to review. There is one other thing I'd like to mention while we're parked on this slide. Um, so we've talked about these five distinct lobes for the cerebral hemispheres. And um, there, there are, just as a note, there are neurons that connect these different lobes together. And that's really important too. So particularly, let's just focus in on the frontal and parietal lobes. There has to be some way uh, to communicate between these lobes, right? We just, we just went through that the parietal lobe allows us to sense things about our surroundings and the frontal lobe allows us to carry out voluntary movements. So what is kind of the bridge between those two? There has to be some sort of a connecting bridge. And that bridge is provided through what are called mirror neurons. I'll write this down, mirror neurons. And mirror neurons um, do a number of really important things. For one, they just allow that integration of sensory and motor activity, um, but they also have connections down to like the insula even um, and other regions of the brain. And this helps us to ultimately tie in emotional experiences with physical experiences. Um, so in the end, a lot of the social skills that we have are thought to be tied to the activity of these mirror neurons, being able to understand what other people are going through and the emotions that they might be experiencing as a result of that. Um, this leads to, to a lot of our social skills, really. And so there's some thought, there's some research going on in terms of just autism, um, people researching whether maybe it's the mirror neurons that are affected in cases of autism, where just the so social skills are not quite um, developed in the same way as most of the population has.